On the evening of that day, Resurrection Sunday, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week. By the way, that's why we, uh, that's why the church at large traditionally gathers on Sunday. It's the day of our risen Lord. Anyways, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. It's the Greek word equivalent essentially to the Hebrew word that we're familiar with, shalom, right? He greets them, shalom, peace be with you. Now, Jesus, of course, is risen from the dead and he's already had the the boys, John and, and Peter, find the empty tomb along with Mary Magdalene. We covered that in the first 18 verses. John realizes and recognizes based on the evidence there at the tomb that Jesus has in fact risen from the dead. And, and, and then Jesus, in, in this beautiful and powerful way, interacts with Mary, calls her by name, and sends her on a mission. You would think on some level that this would be enough for the disciples just to be stoked and to move forward in joy. But the reality is they just had quite the weekend, yes? Their Savior, the Messiah, the one whom they had forsaken all else to follow and and, and commit their entire life to, they watch him suffer and die a death by crucifixion. And it says that they're together, but they lock the door shut for fear of the Jews. The guys that were upset with Jesus and and arrested and put Jesus to death, the disciples are fearful now that they're next. Jesus was crucified. Are we about to be crucified too? And so just like someone who's nervous that someone might want to break in or something, you know, they, they shut and they lock it down. They, they lock the doors shut. As, as a guy, it's, it's kind of funny. Um, if, if I'm by myself, sometimes I can tell that, that, you know, like if I'm walking by a car, sometimes maybe like on the way into the grocery store or something, I'll hear the doors lock. You know what I mean? And I'll be like, oh, then there's maybe like a mom and her kids or something. She's just like, not today. You know, and I'm just like, I'm not going to, you know, but, but you hear the doors lock. But if I'm walking with my daughter, then people say, hey, how's it going? You know, they're, it's, it's disarming. Their walls are up. Their doors are shut and locked. They don't want anybody getting in. They're filled with fear. And as as I was thinking about this this week, I found myself thinking about that story in the Old Testament back in Daniel chapter three, Shadrach and Benny, for those of you who grew up with veggie tales, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Along with Daniel and the cream of the crop of Israel and, and Babylon's first pass through Israel, they they carried the cream of the crop of the young men of Israel captive to Babylon. And and these guys were in that group that was carried captive. And there's lots of great stories in the book of Daniel you can read about. But the one that these three are particularly famous for is, I believe in chapter 3, but when, when King Nebuchadnezzar sets up this golden image this golden statue, and he commands that everybody bow down to it and worship this golden image. Shakrach and Benny, they refuse to do so. They refuse to bow down and to worship any other image or idol or God besides the true and living God, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. 
And so they refused to bow down. And you remember the story. Nebuchadnezzar's filled with fury and he instructs the, the fiery furnace to be heated up seven times hotter than it already was. And then as a punishment, as a penalty for their refusing to worship the golden image, he throws them into the fiery furnace. And, and, and the furnace was heated so hot that the guys who, who threw them in were burned up just because they, they got too close to throw the guys in. It's a story of great faith. Make no mistake about it, on the part of Shackrack and Benny. But I guarantee you, their heart rate was a little higher than normal <laughs> as they were being thrown into that fiery furnace. How could it not be? It was, it was terrifying, no doubt. They're thrown into the flames. But then it says in Daniel chapter 3, verses 24 and 25, once they're thrown into the fires, it says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste and declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said, True, O king. And he answered and said, But I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire. And they are not hurt. And check this out. Nebuchadnezzar says, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. It's like, whoa. These guys are going through the quintessential fiery trial. They're thrown into this furnace. But then, one like the son of the gods, in the words of King Nebuchadnezzar, this Babylonian guy, <laughs> this fourth man appears in there with them. And all of a sudden, everything's okay. The, the, the intensity of the moment, the, the radical reality that they're thrown into, it's quelled. It's, 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 it's all of a sudden apparent to them and everyone else that they're not being harmed, that they're being preserved, that, that it's going to be okay. Where did this fourth man come from? They didn't see a fourth man walking around. They didn't put a fourth man in the furnace. It's as though he somehow materialized in the very furnace in a way that is not natural or usual or typical or regular for us mortals. These guys, not Shackrack and Benny, but Peter and James and John and the crew, they also were going through a fiery trial. It wasn't the same as the fiery furnace with literal flames, but it was this radical trial that weekend. And they are, it explicitly says, filled with fear. And they're not thrown into a, a furnace, but they lock themselves into a room. And there is nothing of peace. There is a total presence of fear. But then, one like the son of the gods appears. How did he get there? He wasn't, he didn't knock, you know, he didn't, they didn't unlock the door and let him in. Evidently, this is an interesting note, Evidently, a resurrection body doesn't interact with the material world in just the same way that our material bodies interact with the material world. There's this new dynamic. A resurrection body doesn't interact with the material world in the same way that our current 
temporal bodies do. And so Jesus materializes within the furnace, within the fear-filled room that has shut doors, locked doors. Perhaps he passes through the walls. It doesn't, it doesn't with incredible detail, tell us how this worked, uh, you know. But Jesus is in there. And it says, Jesus came, verse 19, and stood among them. And as I was thinking about all of these things, I, I just was blessed to consider the, the reality that Jesus has a way of meeting with me, of standing with me, you too. When we're filled with fear, when we're in the midst of a fiery trial, perhaps it seems like the doors in our lives are shut and locked. But friends, shut and locked doors cannot hinder Jesus the Christ. That's such a, a, a comforting truth and reality. We serve a risen Lord who is able to make a way where there is no way. And as we work our, our way through this text today, I, I want to make three observations of Jesus. And, and this is the first. In light of verse 19, Jesus is a way-making redeemer. He is a way-making redeemer. Like that song, you are way maker, miracle worker. He, he, he is God. And he is able to make a way where there is no way. There was no way Shakrak and Benny could survive the flames. There was no way someone could get into the locked room that the disciples were in. But that couldn't hinder Jesus in the book of Daniel or in the book of John. He is able to stand with us, to meet with us. He is able to find a way and make a way where there is no way. When you're in a trial or when you're in a room where the doors are shut and locked and you're filled with fear, he sees you and he cares. And he's at work. You might not realize how he's manifesting himself yet. But, but for those of us who love him and are called by him, he's working all things, even the fiery trials. He's working all things. Like we say, you make all things work together for my good. Romans 8. He's a way making Redeemer. So I want to reiterate one of the points I made last week. And that is because he lives, we can believe boldly. We can believe boldly. In the first 18 verses, we see Mary Magdalene. We talked about this last week. She sees that the, the stone has been rolled away and, and she immediately jumps to the conclusion that somebody must have taken away the body. She makes a bad assumption based on her own instincts and she runs with that assumption in fear. But with the eyes of faith, and this is so much easier said than done. I'm preaching to myself. Sometimes I can see something that seems troubling. The stone is rolled away. And I jump to my conclusions. They must have taken away the body. Or, or they just crucified Jesus. They're coming for me next. <laughs> you know. And I can run with it. Mary literally ran with it and went and told the guys. And then later, we see her running with it mentally. She just is, is spiraling off. It's dark and spinny. And, and she's running with this wrong assumption. She's filled with fear. But we have the stories. Why? So that they can be an example for us. 
whether we're talking about Mary Magdalene and the empty tomb, Shakrach and Benny and the fiery furnace, the disciples locked and, and shut into this room, or Moses before the waters part, or, or Joshua before the walls of Jericho fall, or, or Joseph before he, he sees the end intended by his story as he's thrown into slavery or, or, or David before Goliath falls or, or when he's on the run from Saul or, or Esther when she doesn't know how it's going to work out, but she knows that her people are, are, it's looking like they're doomed or Abraham when he went from Ur of the Chaldeans where he was from and, and he didn't know where he was going, but he went out by faith. We, we can look through story after story after story and, and with God's help and grace, Allow it to build our faith because we serve a risen Lord who is able to make a way where there is no way. The walls of Jericho did fall. Esther and her people were delivered. Joseph's suffering was not meaningless. It was filled with purpose and through his story, the seed, the son of promise is preserved the line of the tribe of Judah through which Jesus ultimately comes. David's story has, has served and blessed so many of us as we get to catch a glimpse into the heart of the man who was after God's heart as he pours out his heart in the Psalms. And God would ultimately be faithful to fulfill the anointing that was poured out on his head with that horn of oil by the man of God, Samuel, and, and, and he will be king of Israel. I mean, story after story, testimony after testimony, we can see and take it to the bank that even if it's a scenario that's, that's fiery and scary or all of the doors in our life seem shut and locked, maybe we shut them and locked them out of fear. Or maybe it's out of our control one way or the other we can see that we serve a risen Lord who is a way-making redeemer. And, and I added the word redeemer to that point because, again, in verse 19, Jesus, Jesus excuse me, immediately extends this peace, this shalom. It means peace in the way we're familiar with the word peace, but also it means whole. It means entire. It means complete. It means without lack. It's how David in Psalm 23 is able to say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I like the way the NIV phrases Psalm 23, one, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Originally, this word was used to describe when they were building a wall out of brick. If there were no pieces missing and, and all of the pieces were in line, they would say this wall has shalom. It's, it's whole, it's entire, it's right and complete. But... If one brick fell off or was misaligned, they would say that wall lacks shalom. You know, like if you're putting together a puzzle and then the entire puzzle is complete, but one piece is missing, that puzzle's not shalom. Isaiah 53. Verse five says, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us shalom, that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. We are made whole. Because of sin, because of the fall, we are all broken and not at shalom. There's a hole in the soul of every man, as it has been said. We're not entire, we're lacking, we're wanting, we're, we're needy, we're damned. But the prophet Isaiah says, he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought that finishing peace 
to you and to me if we'll receive it by grace through faith in Christ. We can be made whole. The word redeemed means to purchase back with the price in order to set free. He's a way-making redeemer who can triumphantly show up as a risen king, proclaiming shalom to his people. Can, can, can you see that? He, 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 he has been crushed and pierced and wounded, chastised, so that now, as a risen Savior, as a way-making Redeemer, for us to be made whole, he proclaims to his boys, peace be with you. And this was a common greeting in those days, but we know that it's, it's more than just a common greeting in, in its usage here because John repeats it again in verse 21. Peace be with you. He's saying, hey, no, 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 you gotta understand. Jesus is, is proclaiming shalom. He's made a way for us to be made whole. He's a way-making redeemer. Number two, he's a wounded healer. Number two, he's a wounded healer. Verses 20 and 21. Verse 20, when he had said this, he showed them his hands bearing the, the scars and the wounds having been nailed to the cross through his hands. And, and he showed them his side, which was pierced through with a spear so that the executioners could verify that he was truly dead. So when he says, peace be with you, then he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. They're filled with joy. They were previously filled with fear. Shakrach and Benny we're getting thrown into a fiery furnace and this is scary. <laughs> but then one like the son of the gods materializes in the furnace and all of a sudden it's all good. Jesus, the son of God, appears with them in their midst, proclaiming shalom and all of a sudden, the fear is gone like darkness flees when you flip the switch and the light of the joy and gladness of God, the joy of the Lord, the joy that comes with Christ fills that room that was previously filled with fear. And they were glad when they saw the Lord. Verse 21, Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. He's a wounded healer. One significant note here is that by revealing himself to them, he's giving them the assurance that he really is risen. They're eyewitnesses to the resurrection. That's very significant. We all as believers don't need to see with our eyes in order to believe. But God in providence, God in sovereignty ordained that there would be a select few the apostles and, and, and hundreds of other witnesses to the resurrection to provide for the rest of us a firm foundation, a solid foundation, a faithful witness and testimony to the truthfulness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So he reveals himself to them and, and, and shows the wounds in his hands and in his side so that we all can have a trustworthy witness to believe. And that's how we believe primarily any historical thing that's happened in the past to be true. I can't see George Washington. I wasn't there. I can't tell you by my own experience that George Washington was the first president of the United States.
we we often hear people talk about science and and I, I need you to prove to me the, the truthfulness of the Bible and, and the gospel of Jesus using the scientific method, but that's nonsensical. I've mentioned this in the past, past, but it bears repeating. The scientific method requires that something be measurable, testable, observable, repeatable, right? You have your... your your idea, you test it, you observe the results, you repeat that for consistency and so forth, and therefore make your conclusions based on the data. But nobody does that in a court of law because you can't, you can't run things that happened through that sort of process. What you need is evidence, and there is perhaps nothing more powerful in a court of law than eyewitnesses and multiple corroborating eyewitnesses. And so God wanted there to be multiple corroborating eyewitnesses to the resurrection. And so he reveals himself to them in this way. That, that's very significant. I wanted to cover that base. Can't hit everything, otherwise we'd still be in chapter two, but, but that one's worth highlighting for a moment. We have a faithful witness and testimony to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But also, like I, I, I said, he's a, a wounded healer And this is just good in terms of application. When I'm thinking about this story, I'm thinking about these guys. They're fearful and locking themselves in this room. They don't need a new teaching or philosophy or program or resource. They need him. And as I consider that, the reality sets in to my soul and my spirit. Whatever I'm going through, whatever fiery trial, whatever shut and locked door, all any of us are ever truly in need of is him. And, and sometimes that's hard to see and other times it's plain to see. But the reality is true regardless that all any of us ever truly need is him. And if we have him, if we know him, if the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. I shall not want. And so he doesn't come in there with three points that start with P. He doesn't give them a bunch of weapons to fight the opposition. He doesn't give them philosophy or resources or whatever. They need him. And so he gives them himself. Not only does he give them himself, but he's real with them. He shows them his wounds. He could have just showed them himself. He could have covered them up. That's what most of us do typically. We're all wounded people in one way or another, but we typically don't lead with that. And that, in a lot of ways, is a good thing most of the time. But there is a time and a place to let people see your wounds. Jesus understood that his story of pain would be their story of hope. Let me say that again. Jesus understood that his story of pain would become their story of hope, their story of victory. His cross would become something we want to wear around our neck, place on our Bibles, put up in our churches, 
His story of pain and suffering, his wounds, would become our story of victory and hope and joy. It brings gladness. It brings salvation. Jesus is a wounded healer. He knew that by his stripes, we would be healed. Right? Isaiah 53. He's a wounded healer. And there's a powerful lesson in that for you and for me. I I love this quote I came across. Henry Nguyen said this, Nobody escapes being wounded. We are all wounded people, whether physically, emotionally, mentally, or spiritually. The main question is not, how can we hide our wounds so that we don't have to be embarrassed? But how can we put our woundedness into the service of others? When our wounds cease to be a source of shame and become a source of healing, we have become wounded healers. Jesus gives them assurance of his, of his resurrection. Here I am, guys. But more than that, he's real with them and he exposes his wounds to them and invites them to touch and and to see and behold because he understands that his story of pain will become their story of hope. And that is a blessing for us, but it's also a model for us. We can imitate him. We can follow in his example and become wounded healers too. The New Testament talks about comforting others with the comfort we've received. These are my wounds. This is my story, Esther could say. My people were about to be extinct. But I had a conviction from the true and living God, to step out in faith. And here's how he showed up. And Haman went down. Joseph was able to say, what what, what you guys did, you you meant it for evil. The devil, he meant it for evil. But, But God intended it for good. You could go through these stories and, and you can see how in retrospect, All of these Bible characters, their their stories of pain have become our stories of hope in the true and living God who is, number one, a way-making redeemer. We each have a story how this way-making redeemer has made himself real and, and a savior in each of our stories. We have the opportunity to imitate him and become a participant on mission with him. We can become wounded healers too. Don't, don't, don't misunderstand and be like, okay, I'm going to go full Eeyore mode all the time and just cry my story to everybody and everybody's doing good. The room's filled with gladness, but I'm going to fill it with my heaviness. You know, No, that's the, no. But as the Holy Spirit leads you, and when the moment is, is appropriate and, 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 it's, and it's a God thing for you to, to reveal yourself and, and your wounds and your story and say, here's how he made a way for me where there was no way. Here's, here's how Jesus, the true and living God, intervened and saved. And, and, and here's my story of pain and suffering. Let me communicate and, and, and share that with you with a view towards it being your story of hope. That, that's, that's the heart and idea here. Look again at verse 21. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. The disciples are becoming apostles. A disciple is a disciplined one. A disciple is a learner. A disciple is an apprentice, one who spends time with the master and over time becomes more like the master. And when the time is right, is sent out to carry on the work of the master. 
First, the master will say, just be with me. I'll do it. You watch. You, you learn. And then when the apprentice, when the disciple's ready, he'll say, okay, now you, you try it. You do it. And I'll watch and, and provide assistance and help as necessary. But then when the disciples got it, he'll say, okay, first I did and you watched, then you did and I watched, now you do and someone else can watch. Jesus is saying, even as the Father sent me, now I am sending you. The word apostle means one sent with a message or commission. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. I want you to carry on my work, carry on my mission. Preach and teach the gospel. Like me, Jesus could say, of Christ crucified and risen in glory. Salvation by grace through faith alone and the finished work that he's accomplished. Go and be wounded healers. Carry on my work. It's beautiful. So first, verse 19, he's a way-making redeemer. Secondly, verses 20 and 21, he's a wounded healer. But then verses 22 and 23, he's a life-giving savior. Number three, he's a life-giving savior. Verse 22, and when he had said this, he breathed on them. And he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. First, real quick, I want to deal with verse 23 because that can be confusing. Jesus does not give them the ability to provide forgiveness. Only God can do that. Only Christ has accomplished that with his work on the cross. And, and that's verified with the resurrection. God alone, Christ alone, has the ability to provide forgiveness. Forgiveness. So what's going on here? Because he says, if you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven them. And if you withhold the for, uh, forgiveness from any, it is withheld. He does not give them the ability to provide forgiveness. He gives the church, these guys and, and, and us too, he gives us the authority to proclaim forgiveness and to proclaim guilt. Not the ability to provide forgiveness, but the authority to announce forgiveness or guilt. We have the authority based on the word of God and based on Jesus, the Christ. We have the authority to proclaim and announce to people that if you receive him, as your Lord and Savior, if you confess with your mouth that you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, your sins are forgiven you. On the flip side of the coin, if I can find it, I, I think it was John chapter 8. I don't think I made it. Oh, yeah, I did. John 8, 24, Jesus says, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Jesus is very straightforward. Unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Now he's giving us the authority to communicate that truth too. If you reject Jesus, do not believe that he is who he says he is and you will die in your sins. Forgiveness is withheld. And it will be withheld. This is the idea here. And what I love about this, a couple things. One, it's, it's a really cool thing to understand that I can speak, not with my own authority, but I can speak authoritatively standing on the authority of Jesus and the word of God. I can with confidence and love speak the truth. 
And when the Holy Spirit's leading me and carrying me along to communicate the reality and result of sin, it can lead someone to salvation. But then on the flip side too, there can be something so powerful to not just read that you're forgiven or to know intellectually that, okay, like I'm I'm forgiven. But sometimes you still feel dirty or sometimes you still feel condemnation that's not from God. And there, there are times when it is so powerful to have somebody proclaim over you. Have you ever had this happen? Somebody proclaims over you Put your name in the blank. They could, they could say to me, Jake, you're forgiven. You're perfectly forgiven and loved. I've, I've had that happen, and it's, it's, it, it, it's a powerful thing to hear somebody with an audible voice and love in their heart say, no, there's no more condemnation for those of us who are in Christ. You are perfectly forgiven. And and for them to say that, not with a wishful thinking kind of a countenance and tone, but with authority based on the word of God. Authoritatively, Jake, you're forgiven. Perfectly and completely, thoroughly, you are forgiven. Your sins are washed white like snow because of the blood of Jesus Christ. That is a gift Jesus is enabling his guys in his church to give to people. We can say to people, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you're forgiven. That's, that's really, really cool. But, but to back it up, When Jesus is saying, peace be with you, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you, verse 22, when he had said this, it says he breathed on them. This is new creation language. This is new life language. This is regeneration language. New creation. New life. He breathed on them. We've seen that before. Let me just read to you from Ezekiel 37. It says, the hand of the Lord was upon me and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord, Ezekiel 37, 1, and set me down in the middle of a valley and it was full of bones. And he led me, the, the prophet, around among this valley full of bones. And behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley. And behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? I said, oh, Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. Now I will lay sinews tendons upon you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. And so he prophesies over the bones and these dead bones live. I love that. I'll put breath in you and that which is dead will will, will be given new life. New creation, regeneration. Seen this in Genesis. Genesis 2, verse 4. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. 
And the man became a living creature. He breathed the breath of life and the man came to life. New creation. Jesus, when he had said these things, it says he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. There's some debate. Some, some say that this is purely symbolic because we know that at Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit falls and is given to the church. But personally, I don't, I don't think it's purely symbolic. I think that if Jesus breathes on you and says, receive the Holy Spirit, I think something happens. It's just my opinion, my speculation. But I think here we see the disciples and, and many commentators and scholars agree, but it is split. So I'm at least wanting to say that, but I, I think we're seeing them born again. The dwelling, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is happening now for the first time. This is when they're born again. This is when they're, they're given new life. They're, they're becoming this new creation. The New Testament speaks of this new humanity. We're fallen in the first Adam, but then the second Adam comes and makes a way for this new humanity to be brought to life, filled with and led by the Holy Spirit, and in the, the vernacular of the New Testament, in, in the verbiage of Ephesians, we're to put off the old man. Or in Romans, when we're baptized, our, our old man is, is, is dead in the burial waters of baptism, right? But then we're lifted up out of the burial waters of baptism to be identified with Christ, not only in his death, but in his resurrection. And, and we're, we're soaking wet. We're... we're, we're brought out of death to walk in the newness of life. We put off the old man, Ephesians says, and we put on the new man, this new humanity, this new life, animated because we've received the breath of life. And just as much as God breathed life into Adam, Jesus was breathing life into his boys. And we have this indwelling relationship now with the Holy Spirit. And then in Acts 2, and again, this is my opinion, but, but in, in at Pentecost, I think we see then the coming upon power of the Holy Spirit to be witnesses and to, to do ministry. Ponder that on your own time, but, but I, I think this is significant here. Jesus breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. Just like God gives life to Adam formed out of the dust. Or, or just like life is given. Ezekiel prophesies over the dead bones and they spring to life. Jesus is a life-giving Savior. He breathes life into the disciples and he breathes life into us. I'm so thankful for this reality. Finally, in conclusion, let's, let's read verses, beginning in verse 24, and, and we're just going to march right through. It says, Now Thomas was one of the twelve, called the twin. He was not with them when Jesus came. So, so when this story that we've been talking about happened, Thomas was missing. And so the disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. And so he gets the name, the nickname, Doubting Thomas. Although I'll say, I don't think he deserves the nickname Doubting Thomas, at least not any more than all of them did. They were all locking themselves in a room fearful. <laughs> right? like, it's not like everybody else is just bold in faith and then Thomas was the one outlier of fear and doubt. Um, if Thomas is doubting Thomas, then they're all doubting disciples. And truth be told, so are we. 
<laughs> right? It says he was the twin, and, and some have suggested that the twin is unidentified because you and I are the twin. <laughs> you can put your name in the blank. Just like he has doubts, we too can have doubts. We, we look just like him, you know. One commentator said a better nickname for him would be Honest Thomas. He's honest about his concerns. He's honest about his unbelief. And though it's still unbelief, at least it's honest. Well, Thomas is honest. But then eight days later, and if you're interested in this sort of thing, eight is the number of new beginnings in the Bible. Everything hits the fan and God's like, I'm going to flood the earth, but eight will we'll go onto the ark. You, you can tease it out and play it out. Eight, the number of new beginnings. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them this time. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. Perhaps, perhaps they were still freaked out that they were going to get arrested and crucified too. Maybe they were like, last time we did this, Jesus showed up like for Shakrach and Benny. We want to see him show up again. I, I don't know what their heart was here, but, but they, they do the same thing. The doors are locked. And again, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. John repeats this another time, emphasizing the shalom Jesus announces over them, pronounces over them. And then Jesus says to Thomas, verse 27, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. I heard you, Thomas. You didn't know I was there. You didn't believe I was risen but I heard you. And Jesus does two things simultaneously. One, he graciously and gently and lovingly with kindness gives Thomas everything he said he needed to believe. Jesus meets all of his demands. But simultaneously, he, he gently, lovingly corrects him. Do not believe, or, or excuse me, <laughs> do not disbelieve, but believe. I heard you. So if you, need, if, if you need it, go ahead. Touch my wounds. Don't disbelieve. Believe. As believers, we don't need to see in order to believe. But Acts chapter 1 says that in order to be an apostle it was a requirement that they were a witness to the resurrection. And so I don't think Jesus is doing it purely just so that he will believe. I, I think that he, he's giving him this requirement. He's giving him this royal treatment that was given to the apostles again so that the rest of us could have a faithful witness. These guys were giving this overwhelming evidence so that we could have their testimony to believe. And I think the primary reason Jesus is, is correcting, is, is gently rebuking his unbelief, is because the word of the apostles, the witness of the apostles, should be enough. According to Jesus, the witness of the apostles should be enough for us to believe. And, and, and John is writing with purpose. We'll get into that in a second, but, but first, I got to give Thomas some credit here. Thomas answered Jesus, verse 28, my Lord and my God. In this beautiful way, it's like Thomas drops all of his demands. He drops all of his requirements. Some suggest that, well, he must have reached out and touched the wounds, but John doesn't say he did. Based on the text, it seems reasonable to say that, that now that Jesus is here, he, 
his demands went out the window. He sees the Lord. He hears his voice. He sees the wounds. And he doesn't need to reach out and, and, and touch them before he says the best answer any of us could ever say. My Lord and my God. This is, this is John's point in, in recording this story. And this is really the conclusion of the Gospel of John. Chapter 21 is like an epilogue. It's all been driving to the crucifixion and resurrection. And now John presents Thomas' story. Why? So that we can look at him and, and see his whole ordeal and ultimately come to the same conclusion. Jesus is the Lord. He's my master and king and God. He is the one that I'm going to place on the throne in my heart and life. He's the true and living God. He's the one that I worship. He is my Lord and my God. No further requirements are needed than the testimony of the apostles. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And, and I think John perhaps is including that little detail, that nugget right there, because sometimes we can think to ourselves, my goodness, are we missing out? Am I missing out on a blessing because I didn't get to see in person like they did? And John records this nugget so that I can look at it and say, no, in fact, I'm not only not missing out on a blessing, I gain a blessing if I believe having not seen. There's a special blessing God imparts to those of us who simply do what Jesus is like. Thomas, you should have, you should have done in the first place. You should have believed the word of the apostles, the witness and testimony of the apostles. And then John's very straightforward. He says, now... Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written. The seven signs we, we studied through in the Gospel of John. And then ultimately the crucifixion and resurrection and these appearances to the followers of Jesus. These are recorded. This is the written record. It's a faithful testimony. An eyewitness testimony of the apostles. So that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that, believe, that by believing you may have life in his name. John lays it all out before the reader. What are you going to do with the testimony and witness of the apostles? Do not disbelieve, but believe. And it's not about mere information. I'm giving you this information so that you can experience transformation. Like the dead bones brought to life, like Adam receiving the breath of life. May you believe and believing be filled with life. Believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing have life in his name. May God give us grace to believe in this way-making redeemer, this wounded healer, this life-giving savior, to become disciples and perhaps apostles to carry the torch of the good news of Jesus into this generation that we live in. Amen.